Sema refers to the merciful protection to the Lord. The Lord helps the devotee to achieve Krishna consciousness by yoga, and when he becomes fully Krishna conscious, the Lord protects him from falling down to a miserable conditioned life. Ukram kara di vachanam panga flanga i te grim yit kribam kamam nude si grum di natalina. Ananyas jinti om te mam yeti la pai pasate. It's a very famous verse from the Bhagavad Gita. Um, there's a story connected to it as well. Once there was a learned scholar who was writing a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. His name was Arjuna Acharya. And Arjuna Acharya uh, was going over the manuscript. In those days, um, there were no printed books. And oftentimes, uh, there were only, uh, only hand-copied manuscripts, and oftentimes, there were some mistakes in these manuscripts. If you wanted a copy of a book, you would ask a Brahmin to give him some donation and he would just hand copy the book for you. But, you know, in the course of copying, you know, something was done quickly, something wasn't written properly, something mis misspelled. So sometimes there were some mistakes. So when uh, when it came to this verse, uh, Krishna said, um, But those who always worship me with exclusive devotion, meditate on my transcendental form, <coughs> to them I carry what they, lack and I, what they lack and I preserve what they have. Yoga um, Vahamiyam. So when Arjuna Acharya saw the word Vahamiyam, where it indicated that Krishna personally was making arrangements to help his devotee. So, no, that cannot be right. Um, it probably, Mahami, probably was misspelled, probably should have been Karomi. I will get it done somehow or other, that the devotee is supported. I'll make some indirect arrangement for his support. Um, that's what Arjuna Ajayi thought. And then he made, so he made a, a correction in the original text. He took it out and he, instead of that word, Vahami, he wrote Karoni. Then it was time for the lunch break and uh, in traditional India, they would buy everything fresh. Right? So even nowadays, quite often. So he would go out to the market and we buy everything fresh and then bring it back for lunch. Uh, and then his wife would cook and so on. So on this occasion he went to the market and after a short while 
two boys came with a bread with a bag of groceries, everything was there, sabjis, atta, you name it, rice, the whole thing. Right? And uh, these boys they came to to bring the uh, the supplies. And they said, your husband has sent us to deliver this. And uh, yes, so please accept it. Uh, and then uh, we must uh, we must go. Uh, please, please, please. Uh, 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 so, anyway, Arjuna Charya was in this way uh, sending these two boys from the market. They looked very nice. One was kind of, they were very young, beautiful, one was a little darkish, the other one was light complexion. And uh, so she said to the boys, oh, so nice you came. No, you don't need to go, just come in and I will give you something to, to eat and something. She said, oh, no, 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 we have to go. He said, no, it's no problem. Why are you are in such a rush? You know, you can stay. He said, no, no, we cannot stay. We are afraid of your husband. She said, why are you are afraid of my husband? He said, my husband, he doesn't harm anyone. He's very nice. And then the boy said, oh, no, he doesn't harm anyone. And then the, the dark one, he turned around and he showed his back. And there was a beating mark on his back. And then she said, no, no. Did my husband do that? Did my husband, did he do that? No, I can't believe it, the brute. How to be children, no. She was very, very upset. And the boys immediately ran away. So, you know. Then she uh, started cooking. And unlike normal, uh, where a lady in Vedic times would first feed the husband and then eat herself. She just ate. <laughs> yes. So, you know, when the husband came home, uh, the wife had already eaten. So it's like, uh, what's going on, right? Something unusual. And then he asked, says, like, what's, what's wrong? And then she says, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you know how ladies get when they get in that mood. Right? <laughs> you know. And they refuse to speak, and you know you have to, you have to first suffer for a while, <laughs> and after you've suffered enough, uh, then they will finally reveal to you what the reason is why you know they are not speaking. So eventually, you know, she said, like, you know, I never expected this kind of behavior from you. You know that you would be children. I'll never speak to you again. Yeah. Anyway, a whole domestic drama and so on. And then at the end of that, what came of it was, she said like, yes, boys, what boys are you talking about? She says, yes, the boys you sent with the supplies, you know very well. He said, boys with the supplies, what did they look like? He said, come on, you know, you don't play games with me now. No, what did they look like? You know very well. One was darkish and the other one was white. He said, no, would it be that maybe Krishna and Balaram came to my door? No, it cannot be. But then he thought, somehow or other he felt the super soul direct him and he just went to his manuscript of the Gita and he saw that the correction that he had made from Vahami to Karomi was put back. You will be saying of Vahami. So you didn't believe that I personally made the arrangement. All right. And I'll personally come to your door and I'll personally correct your mistake. I'll carry what you lack and preserve what you have. So, in this way, Krishna carried what the Brahmana lacked and preserved what he had and made sure that the manuscript of the Gita remained in its pure form. And that it indicated, indeed, for the devotee, Krishna personally comes and Krishna personally makes arrangements for us. Therefore, uh, it is said a devotee can be a bhaya or fearless. And there's no need to be, to be in, in fear and anxiety about what will happen and will it happen. 
it's not happening or it is happening and, you know, and so on. And some things are not happening and some things are happening and so much anxiety uh, we have in life. But actually Krishna says, don't worry, don't worry, I am there. I'll preserve everything. You, you have all the good you have, you're not going to lose anything. And whatever you're lacking, I will carry that. Pralad Maharaj, no, I'm sorry, Dhruva Maharaj is another story like that. That Dhruva Maharaj, he was a five-year-old boy, he wanted to sit on his father's lap, but the father had a co-wife. So co-wife was the young queen and Dhruva's mother the older one. So the younger queen was with the king and she said, no, no, you can't sit on your father's lap. No, only those who are born from me. They can sit on your father's lap. <laughs> Go away, you rascal. So anyway, Dhruva was very much insulted, especially not just by her, but because the king didn't say anything. That he was angry with. He was angry with the king. Especially with the king. That the king didn't protest at that time. So anyway, then Dhruva was very angry and he came to his mother and he complained to his mother. And then his mother said, yes, everything she said is true. She said, I am the unwanted wife of the king. Yes. And only, and she has his favor and it is true. His children, um, her children have his favor. And he couldn't care see me at all. She said, there is nothing, nothing I can do. Then Tova wasn't ready to take that for an answer. And he said, nothing, is there no one who can help? She said, no, I can't think of anyone but for the Supreme Lord. He said, okay, where is he? <laughs> I'll go see him. And she said, like, well, I don't know where he is, but they say that he's in the forest. Who said, okay, I'll go to the forest. He went to the forest, performed great austerities, and there in the forest, eventually, the Lord appeared before him and he got all, all blessings and benedictions. And Dhruva had asked for a kingdom greater than his, than his father. But when he saw Krishna, he realized that actually this was a, a foolish foolish request, that now he had received something much greater, greater than a kingdom. Uh, what's a kingdom? He had seen the Lord himself. So then, Dhruva said, I wanted broken pieces of glass and you gave me diamonds. So this is the Supreme Lord. When we turn to Krishna, he will fully satisfy us. We do not need to be in anxiety that I'm going to miss out, oh my God. If I become a devotee, then I have to give up so many things. And if I give up all these things, you know, it's like, and I'm still young, then maybe I will miss out. And what about that, you know what I mean? I'm not so sure. No, no one ever misses out with Krishna. Rather, in material life, we are missing out. Because in material life, it is like that. That you dream, you dream this big, and reality is only this big. Everyone is false. But in spiritual life, reality is greater than you can dream. And that's what happened to Dhruva. He dreamt of a kingdom greater than his father, and he got something greater. He got Krishna. So in this way, in spiritual life, whatever we get will exceed our expectations. And that is the most beautiful thing of taking shelter of Krishna. Therefore, there is no anxiety in taking shelter of Krishna. Rather, everything will be taken care of. All our desires, they will be fulfilled. So, yeah, but what about, you know, I have some material desire. And don't worry, don't worry. Either Krishna will take them away, and we'll get new desires, like Dhruva Maharaj, who oh, wanted a kingdom and then he didn't care for a kingdom anymore. You'll change. You'll change. So this is the secret. This is how we can 
take the leap of faith. Uh, philosophers speak of that. Oh, the current is too strong. Excuse me. Can I offer it to you? My nose can no more deal with it. Come closer. Very good day. My nose is misbehaving. So, yeah, it's for you. Krishna's plan. <laughs> So in this way, um, we put our faith in Krishna. Does that mean that the devotee who puts his faith in Krishna is not at all making material arrangements? No, it is not that. Um, it is said one should One should work in this world, but one should not be attached of the fruits of one's labor. The fruits of one's labor, there is those one should offer to Krishna. So we should work as if we are, uh, as if our, the result of the work depends on us. But in the end, whatever comes start, we accept it. It comes from Krishna. So in this way we know that there is no anxiety. Everything is, is perfect. It is just, uh, everything will be perfect. Nothing is lacking. Um, of course, one cannot artificially, artificially come to such a state of consciousness. It takes some time to develop that. But this verse is there to encourage us. Uh, this is the encouragement. Now, in order to become, well, so at least intellectually, we can accept this verse as truth. Now, emotionally, we are not yet there. That takes a little, a little longer. But all right, it helps to intellectually accept. And then emotionally comes later. Now, we then take to purification. By engaging in devotional service, we become <coughs> purified. Dr. Srila Prabhupada is speaking about devotional service in this uh, purport. He speaks about the ninefold process of devotional service. Sravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Sharanam, Palasevanam, Archanam, Sakyam, Dasyam, Atmanivedanam. Uh, it is said that first hearing, we hear about Krishna and about devotional service, and that life is in this body is temporary, but that the soul is eternal. And that as an eternal soul, we should engage in the eternal relationship with Krishna. Whatever we invest in that relationship, that will stay. And then later, that will bring us the most wonderful fruits. One year, I was in a uh, retreat in a forest with 400 people in the Czech Republic. 400 people. And, uh, you know, I myself, I'm getting a little older, so I'm following some diet, so I don't always eat all the heavy preparations, not all the tasty ones, I eat the boring things. <laughs> so, it was lunchtime, so I went to my room to eat some boring things, uh, while all the devotees were going for the tasty prasadam. What to do? So, I wasn't there at the time of prasadam, but, you know, usually, you hear the mantra, right? Saya Vijaja Vinayate So I was sort of walking away and it was Pasad time, so I was waiting for the mantra. But instead, I heard Namaste Narasimhaya And I go, that's the mantra for protection. I mean, you know, is somebody afraid that they're going to eat too much or something? <laughs> it didn't make sense. And why are they chanting this mantra? So something, something strange, something unusual. So I turned around and I walked back and I went where the devotees were and there was one man and he was lying on the ground with a heart attack and his face was turning gray and it looked bad and, you know, so all the devotees were around him, 400 devotees stood in a circle around him, chanting Hare Krishna. The, the kirtan was deafening, deafening. And his men lying in the middle of the crowd. So anyway, the temple president called a helicopter. 
then called alarm number, you know, helicopter came in, some rescue guys and overalls and machines and put electric shock, but, you know, and they tried to bring him back to life. And 400 devotees were thinking, let him die. <laughs> let him die. Better he dies now, at the time of 400 people chanting the holy name, than that he lives a few more hours and then dies in the hospital without anybody there. Because if he dies in the middle of such a kirtan, that kirtan will carry him to the spiritual world. So anyway, the man died. And he died in the middle of this kirtan. So it was just something amazing. And the atmosphere was, was, was very positive because it was just, what did this man do that he had such a departure, such a blessed departure? Who was he anyway? Nobody knew him. We asked around. Finally, one devotee said, yes, yes, this man. I know this man for years. He used to buy books from me. He bought, some two years ago, he bought a full set of Bhagavatam from me. And then he said, about one month ago, I met him again. And he said, I finished the books. I read them all. Do you have any more? So I sold him some more books, yes. And then I told him, why don't you come to our summer camp, our retreat in the forest? He said, all right, I come. He said, and actually he had just arrived that day. It was his first day. And he had, well, the night before he had arrived, he, was, he had done the full morning program, Angularity, he had chanted Japa with the devotees, he'd gone to the lecture and everything. He'd been to the seminar, the kirtan, all the programs. And then at lunchtime, heart attack, and he just left like that. And the more we heard it, the more we just started to realize, this is amazing. Huh? This is all Krishna's arrangement. Somehow or other this man must have previously done some service and now it has fructified. And therefore, everything became auspicious for you. And Krishna said, all right, now, now you can come. And Krishna just took him took him to the spiritual world. Um, because one who leaves in the middle of a kirtan will just go back to the spiritual world. So it was amazing. And we were just speaking about it. And I remember still what I was talking about that night. Um, I was, I remember what I was talking about that night. I was talking about that in life we do so many things, but what really is important and what really matters is what, is what we invest in the eternal things. All right, we have to do temporary things. You know, I put clean socks every day. It's important now in this season, and it's very important to me to put socks. You know, nice warm socks I have. <laughs> I even, huh? I'm happy with them. Huh? I like them. They are good, uh, and I'm glad I have them. But on the other hand, I don't live for my socks, you know. And, you know, I, I don't write a book about my socks. Uh, a book by Kadamba Kanana Swami entitled, My Socks. Uh, and I'm sharing uh, with the world my realizations about my socks. Although my socks are important to me, absolutely, you know, I mean, but eh, it's temporary, you know. In the summer I couldn't care less, you know. In fact, on Thursday I fly to Europe and then I will not look at these socks for at least three months. Haha. <laughs> and you'll sit here and freeze, you know, and look at colder and colder and with us, and with us, good day, sunshine. <laughs> So I'm looking forward to a little bit of sun. I already had winter, actually. When you had summer, I had winter already. So uh, whatever it may be. Um, so the temporary things also have a meaning to me. But in comparison to the eternal, eh, it's not so important. So let us at least in between bothering, you know, all day you have to worry about so many temporary things. So many, you know. So many arrangements have to make who's cooking today, and what is this, and who's doing this, and who's that. And someone on the phone for you, okay, just a moment, tell them I'm coming, and I'm taking it in a moment. Something this, something that, so many things to do, whole day busy, the 
temporary things. Let us at least do something eternal. Something. And maybe a lot. Why not a lot? If we do a lot, and then um Yegatamam Prabhadyam Te Tamstatayu Bajanyam. As you surrender unto me, I reward you accordingly. It is like that. What you invest, you get back, you know. Invest one minute, you know. Okay, that's nice. One minute, eternal. One minute in eternity, in eternal service. You get your blessings. One minute worth. Yeah. So you have to invest. You have to invest. This is spiritual life. So it is very important that in spiritual life we, that we make space for that. You know. It will never come on its own. You know. uh, from maybe in the story of Arjuna Acharya, Krishna and Bhagavan came, came knocking on the door. Yeah. Uh, but in many of our cases, it's, uh, it's, it's not always like that. I don't know if Krishna ever knocked on your door. He did knock on mine. Uh, not yet. No. I'm knocking on his door. <laughs> He's not knocking on mine. What can I say? All right. Still, Krishna is helping in so many ways. Uh, you you will probably know that our devotees are promising to chant 16 rounds of Hare Krishna Maha Mantra daily. And of course, at the end of this program, there is a little bit of Japa experience. So I. Uh, 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 yes. Now, uh, what we uh, one devotee, uh, he was tired, very tired, chanting, chanting, and he had something left late in the night, late in the night. So, he said, Hare Krishna, and he sat sat down on the sofa, Hare Krishna, and slowly, sort of leaning to the side. And before he knew it, he was asleep on the sofa. And then he had a dream. And in the dream, someone rang the doorbell. Uh, and he walked to the door and he opened the door. And Prabhupada was standing there. And Prabhupada said, did you finish your rounds? <laughs> <laughs> so, in this way, you know, uh, we are not alone. We are not alone. No. Prabhupada is with us, Krishna is with us. Um, there are two letters that Prabhupada wrote and they're both interesting. In one letter he writes about his spiritual master and he says, my spiritual master has now returned to the spiritual world and he has taken up his eternal form as a manjari. Right? That is letter number one. And in letter number two he writes, this is about a month later, he writes, that although my spiritual master has now entered into his eternal manjari swarup, his eternal form as a, as a gopi with Krishna, I'm sure that he is still watching everything I do. Oh, if the spiritual master goes back to Godhead and enters into the Nietzsche lila, into the eternal lila of Krishna, is he then still watching everything <coughs> we do? Is it? Yes, Prabhupada said. So, oh, if Prabhupada's spiritual master did that, then I'm sure that Prabhupada's also doing it. Oh, yes. He is watching everything we do. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, Shri Prabhupada. Um, yes, in this way, we can know that Prabhupada is still present. Of course they say he lives forever huh, in his words and the follower lives with him right? forever in his books and the follower lives with him. But not only that, he's also still personally present, personally. There is another story. In America there is a famous project which is a big farm known as New Vrindavan. Uh, there was some time that the uh, that that farm was separating from ISKCON and from Prabhupada's movement, and they were not exactly 
strictly following proper standards anymore. It was in time, it was like that. They used to live of tourism because they had a beautiful palace of gold, Prava's palace of gold. And many buses would come with tourists. So there was a tour, and all the tourists came, and a tour guide was there, and ladies and gentlemen. And here we see a beautiful onyx floor, and all this has been carved by the devotees themselves. See the beautiful flower design in the middle. Tourists all click, click. Uh, very nice, very nice. And then it's going, yes. And, and then they took the whole group to the deity of Prabhupada and said, yes, and this is actually the founder of our movement and so on. All the tourists are looking and taking photos and pictures of the, the deity of Prabhupada. And one lady, she heard him speak in a deep voice, deep commanding voice. And he said, take my shoes. Speaking. Take my shoes. Who is speaking? And it seemed no one else was noticing it. Take my shoes. And then the tour guide said, and now we're going to have a look at the ceiling, at the beautiful mosaic inlay that the devotees made with their own hands. And all the tourists. <laughs> looking up and down and the voice said, take my shoes! And so strong that she just did it. And she put them in her bags and never in her life did she steal anything but she stole the shoes. <laughs> it's a big drama. A big drama in the temple. Someone stole Prabhupada's shoes. Who would do such a thing? Who in the world would steal Prabhupada's shoes? It had to be a devotee. Uh, because no one else would care for the shoes. Uh, but the devotee might, uh, might know that the shoes are very valuable. So therefore, the temple authorities decided to call a meeting. And they called everyone in the temple. And they said, We've called everyone together for a very, very serious thing. Uh, someone has made a very, very great apparat, a great offense. The reactions will be terrible, terrible. I mean, I wouldn't want to be in the position of that person who stole Prabhupada's shoes. I don't know how many lifetimes this person will have to suffer in hellish conditions. But, although the offense is very great, the devotees are very forgiving. And therefore, we don't hold it against you. We understand. No problem. You know, this afternoon, after we leave from here, the temple room door will be open, and you can just put quietly put the shoes back and everything for you. So, managers thought, it's done. It's done. You just wait and see. You know, <laughs> at three o'clock these shoes will be back. But at three o'clock the shoes were not back. They were gone, never put it back. Then the years went past, and, and somehow or other, the differences between that group moving down and his combo worked out, and they returned to Prabhupada's standard. They again began to follow Prabhupada's standards. Then that lady who had the shoes, she forgot all about it. She had them for quite some years. And then she had a dream. And suddenly in her dream, Prabhupada came and Prabhupada said, those shoes, right? those shoes that you took, you can return them now. <laughs> right? So then she took the shoes, put them in a parcel and sent it with a letter of explanation to the temple. And that is how the story comes to us. Now, you know, we're looking at the murti of Prabhupada. So, you may not all be aware of that, but in the worship of a murti, of a deity, um, it is the practice that you take the shoes of the deity. In deity worship, there are different arrangements for the care of the deity made. And one of the things is that at night you put the deity to rest. And when it's, you cannot move the deity, like here at night. We cannot take Radha Baba off the altar uh, to put them to rest. But they have a bed. So we are not putting the deities in the bed, they stay on the altar, but we take their shoes and move the shoes from in front of the deity and put them next to the bed. And the scriptures say, yes, the deity then is in the shoes.
So they are present in the shoes. So Prabhupada's shoes were removed. And then he left. And then the shoes came back. And Prabhupada was back. So we should understand that Prabhupada is here. So we're getting a lot of lot more mercy than we thought we were getting. All along we thought, oh, it's so difficult, I have to struggle all by myself in spiritual life. It's extremely difficult. But actually, the truth of the matter is uh, that Krishna and, and his and the, and the previous acharyas are all with us, with blessings. And in that way, they carry us invisibly back to the spiritual world with their blessings. And all we have to do is cooperate. We really have to cooperate. <laughs> Don't really want to. We yeah, have to cooperate and actually come to the temple. All the way to the temple, so far. Yeah. Yes. All the way to, but we have no time. Yes, make time. No, and really, we have to make time. Yes, yes, we have to. And then what we do in the temple? We have to do some service in the temple. Some service. I mean, not just come to eat. That is also service. That is also service. But you could even do more. You could even help cleaning up after the prasad, because then you'll get more mercy. So those who are taking up some service voluntarily, oh, they get the special mercy from Krishna. Everyone gets the mercy of Krishna. But those who do some special service for Krishna, hmm, they get the mercy. Yes. Special mercy. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes. Like that. So isn't that nice? In this way, we're never alone. Krishna is always there, and his pure devotees are always there to help us every step of the way. And therefore, we do not need to worry. If we carry on, we will be successful. And that is the most wonderful thing. And that is the special message of the Gita. And we see that our spiritual master, Sri Prabhupada, was embodied that knowledge of the Gita perfectly. And in that way. And that's how he gave this strength to this movement. Because uh, he wanted no compromise. Bhagavad Gita as it is. Not half baked bhakti, no pure bhakti. Yes. What's the point of half baked bhakti? No. Pure bhakti. Unadulterated. The real thing. That is what he came to give. And that gift is still available to all of us here today. Anyone maybe has a question or a response? You know? Otherwise, we are seeing the troops are assembled and carry their weapons. <laughs> yeah. I have a little announcement. Um, Raj is traveling all over the world. He's not only giving lectures here in Australia, but in many countries, also South Africa. And uh, he has actually a project that he supports very much, that's in Soweto. And um, actually, he is he every year he's here at the Yatra for Soweto. So we're collecting for this. We have a little CD here. It's also recorded in South Africa, so that's. South African fire, South it's very nice. Um, we hand them out, we give them out for $15 each. So it's not so bad, it's a very nice CD. And the uh, whole profit purely goes to that. Rap the Yatra in Soweto. So if you like to have one, please see me after. I'll be out here in the garden sitting in the bench. So please see me. Okay. okay. Very enthusiastic young man from the commercials. <laughs> in bright orange. <laughs> I didn't know, I didn't tell him to do this, okay? I didn't know he was going to do it. Uh, it's appreciated, though. Because, you know, these people need some mercy. So, anyone has a question?
they are so way too old. South Africa is a country with, um, where life is not easy. Um, there has been this apartheid on, on the basis of, of race, and they still have. And Soweto is a big black area through two million African people. And they still have a museum. And in that museum, there are different doors according to the color of your skin. And you go through that museum, and you see different pictures and exhibitions, but you can never get close to anyone from any other race. And they have walls of glass, and as you walk, you are kept separated. We can look and wave at each other from the glass, and we can all see the pictures of how people suffered, and how they were oppressed, and so on. So, so although now they are free, they're still in poverty. And then one year, I saw the devotees there. There's a small temple there with devotees. In South Africa, in Durban, is the, is the area where all the Indians are. So they have two very big temples, Indian temples there. Very big. Not Chota like this one, but big, big. Uh -huh. And uh, these, and there they do a very, very big Ratiyatra in Durban. Huge the biggest Rati Yantra uh, in the world outside of India. It's enormous. Uh, lakhs and lakhs of people and so on. Tandiga could stay here. Till then. Anyway, so very big Rati Yantra. So it's a chariot festival. And there are big kirtans in that. And they made videos of that. And when these African people got the video, they put it in their... Uh, they had a video set and they, they, they saw it on the video and they danced the whole night in front of the TV. That's how much they liked it. So when I heard about that, I thought, okay, I gotta do a Rati Yatra in, uh, in that place. So we did the first one, it was very big. I brought, I brought bands, I brought many Swamis, they wanted the Maharaj, I brought, I brought Kavichanda Maharaj, I brought Bhakti Mark Swami, Bhakti Chaitanya Maharaj, and like, like that. So many Swamis were there. And it was a huge festival. But now it has taken, uh, taken off as an ongoing festival. People are, don't, are not wealthy, so I'm helping them in that way. In this way, uh, we cannot only think of ourselves um, in spiritual life. We have to think for the benefit of others and do something. Alright, now in the back we see devotees there with malas. These devotees will ask us to all together chant one round of, of the Hare Krishna mantra uh, as a means of meditation. Uh, they will guide you through this. It is worthwhile because this chanting is helpful and a great blessing. So.